Dear friends, thank you for joining us. Um, please note that this is only a personal interpretation of the Baha'i teachings. If you wish to have an authoritative stance, please go to baha'i.org. I want to thank the Baha'i administration, all those working in their neighborhoods, and anyone who is trying to work for the betterment of the world. Please note that in the description below you'll be able to find an MP3 version of this, so you don't have to watch it, um, but also a PDF of all the quotes that will be used in any of the deepenings, and timestamps of the different sections. And please subscribe if you'd like to be alerted for any upcoming videos. I titled this deepening The Great Beyond, because it is that question about what is beyond this life, and the realities that we can actually understand about that domain, or that realm of existence. At the same time, these, if you will, six explorations of numerous quotes from the Baha'i Writings is actually only a small cross-section of what the Baha'i Writings contain. There is so much more that we could have studied, and that I believe the more and more writings we look through, and the more and more writings we actually have translated, the better the picture is going to become. And no matter what, uh, in this study much is left to actually be done, and even more so, I, I guarantee you that I have made mistakes along the way in my understanding of the writings. Uh, this is inevitable. There's one beautiful quote I'd like to share uh, from Shoghi Effendi, the guardian of the Baha'i Faith. There is no limit to the study of the cause. The more we read the writings, the more truths we can find in them. The more we will see that our previous notions were erroneous. So as the guardian says, there's no limit to the study of the cause. The more we read, the more truths we find. And, but I love this. The more we will find that our previous notions are erroneous. I know myself, I've been stumbling and attempting to understand the Baha'i Faith and the various world religions um, for about 20 years now. And I consistently come upon things, even within, my own, within our own writings, um, constantly, where I realized, no way, I, I didn't know that. Or, I used to think this, and now with this quote, I can't think that anymore. Uh, I've often said to friends that if you're studying the Baha'i Writings, and you're trying to do your best to do it, you're going to consistently find that you were wrong. And that's what this quote is saying, that it really is an ocean that we need to dive into and do our best to understand. So of course, there are many misunderstandings derived from me, in these series of videos, and pretty much any video that I will share. <laughs> what is the picture that we've seen? We've seen the womb and the world beyond. Um, that we are in this life, if you will, developing in an embryonic state that body which we will have it in the next world. That through our faith, our conduct, our service to our fellow man, we are developing the eyes, the ears, the senses and the body that we will move in the next world with. That we've learned that we have to be detached from this world, but we also in the study looked that we actually have to be detached from that next world. For it is a glorious and wonderful and beautiful place that actually could lead us astray. We find that it's not that there is the next world is in some other place, but rather it is more like the, in one the world in which we live, there might be the mineral, the plant, the animal, and the human, all within one room, but each of those kingdoms not fully aware or not aware at all of the other kingdoms in that domain. That is actually the state that we are in. In a sense, in, in an analogy, we are the plant in someone else's living room. We find that when we move into the worlds beyond, that actually they don't end. They are uh, countless. Infinite range and countless. And that in each of these worlds, there is a heaven and there is a hell. That heaven is defined as finding the will of God and the message of God in that world, and then subsequently, upon recognizing it, seeking to embody it to the best of our ability within the short time of span that we have. But we're told explicitly by Abdu Baha that that same concept of heaven and hell exists within the worlds beyond. That there too, we also learned, that there is a revelation in every world of God sent down in the form of a prophet, as a vehicle for his infinite grace. And as we move into that world, with our new eyes, our new ears, our new body, made up of those heavenly elements, that we then actually have to be able to discern the fragrance of God's manifestation, seek out that long-lost Joseph, 
and find him in his new attire. Once we've done that, it's the same process. We strive to actually share the truths that we know, and in whatever faltering and stumbling way we can, and try our best to actually bring our life into accord with the teachings of the manifestation of God for that day. So we move from one body to another, from world to world, seeking out the manifestation of God, but not necessarily always finding him. This picture that we actually see uh, has sort of a, if you know those gestalt pictures that if you look at them in one way, they look like a duck. And if you look at them in another way, they look like a rabbit. Or there's ones where say it looks like a beautiful young woman, but at the same time, if you look at it another way, it, it suddenly looks like an old woman. Um, I think many aspects of the teachings of the great world religions, including the Baha'i faith, have that, that, that effect. And this is one of those cases. Because I myself was raised within a Christian and then secular uh, environment. Um, and it's like I would hear the, the idea, for example, of going to heaven, of living out a brief span of life, maybe 70, maybe 20 years, within this world, and say, you know, finding Jesus, for example, and then I move into the next world and I, if you will, rest on those laurels for all eternity. There's a sense in which that was uh, sad for me. Um, because the, that's it. Like the, not even the fact that someone might not get much of a chance, but rather that that's the end of it. Now, of course, one would say, but you live out a life in bliss and, and, and wonderment and the beatific, beatific vision of, of God. And that is exquisitely beautiful if you think of it in a certain way. At the same time, there was this, there was this aspect for me where I'm like, okay, well, but th there's no more achieving. There's no more seeking. There's no more striving. There's no more quests, there's no more adventure. But on the flip side, that's actually the beauty of the concept of actually attaining heaven. Right? You've actually won the prize. But the same goes for the other perspective, because we see this notion, and, I, and I, I'm assume for many people it's obvious, that um, the Baha'i perspective, which has both a heaven and a hell, and they are, they seem from some people's perspective have gone away, but no, they truly are real. There is a real heaven and there is a real hell. It just depends what you mean by real. <laughs> but when you move to the actual other facets of it, which is this journeying through endless, if you will, a stacked ontology, a stacked series of realities that we move through, for many people, they look at this and they think, wow, that is, that's, that's actually refreshing, that's actually beautiful, we can make up for lost opportunities. And at the same time, there's this wonderful quest, there's this journey where we keep seeking and finding. It's as if you will, that constant chase and journey towards the Beloved, where we see him in his new attire and find out something more about the Divine Being. And that's actually exquisite, because that is that glorious vision of the Divine that we get in flashes and pulses on our journey. But at the same time, that's samsara. <laughs> um, within the Eastern religions, within Buddhism and Hinduism, there's the concepts of samsara, which is the endless world of birth and death and rebirth. This sense in which it just never ends. <laughs> we are constantly seeking. And it actually can cause, if you will, a sort of uh, despair or sadness at the eternity of it. Of if, especially if you raised up in a system where you thought, well, you know, I achieved it. Right? I, you know, once I get the truth, once I find the truth, that's it, that it's over. I've, I've actually found ultimate truth. When rather, no, this is just one stage upon an endless journey. We cannot rest on our laurels in this life. Once we've recognized, we actually have to embody his teachings as the best we can. And it is through doing such a thing, through, if you will, polishing the mirror of ourselves to reflect the divine image, that we come to know him more and more and more, which enables us, once again, to find him. So there's a sense, really, really, in which you can look at the Baha'i, my understanding of the picture of the Baha'i afterlife, and it actually shifts back and forth. There is beauty, and sometimes there can be, it can be frightening to think that I would actually move into another world, having actually found the manifestation of God in my day, enter that world and actually miss him, not find him again. Or for the fact that I might actually find the, you know, 
the end of my life that I'm suddenly in this wonderful place and the, the experience is just exquisite and there's so many new things, but in actual fact, I'm in a dung heap. <laughs> I'm actually, if you will, a sow in the mud where I could have had so much more, but out of mercy, it's been actually kept from me. And then out of justice, that's where I am. This has both a, whew, I don't have to worry about it so much effect, but at the same time actually has sort of a scary effect. Because you can be in hell and not know it. And this is that sort of, if you will, <coughs> shifting duck rabbit aspect of the Baha'i vision. And of course it gets more and more filled out the more we look at other quotes, and in addition, looking at the holy scriptures of Buddhism and Hinduism and Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Zoroastrianism, etc. On this notion of the justice and mercy, and this is something that I just mentioned, and, and actually just has an exquisite philosophical aspect to it, and I hope I can somewhat convey that to the best of my ability. It's that, how can God be just and both merciful? And the Baha'i picture, as it's been presented here, for me, actually really puts a fascinating spin on this. Because we've already touched on the motif, which is this sense veil. Where when we actually die at the end of our life, we have been building this body in the next world, the eyes and the ears and the nose and the limbs, to be able to navigate that world. In my opinion, in my understanding of the writings, when a soul comes to the end of their life, they are, if you will, a being released from this cage and put in a glorious domain. And what I will propose to consider is, is that's true just about for anyone. That it is a wonderful experience. There is a reckoning, a time when actually they actually realize their wrongs. But at the same time, they end up in a place with a body and a sense organs to be able to explore the realm in which they've, if you will, arrived. Once they do so, they, the analogy I gave is, someone might come up to them and begin talking about, say, colors, but they can't see them. That individual then begins to express, if you will, them through the modes of, say, temperature or texture, but they can't actually understand. There is this sensory veil. You cannot actually really communicate to somebody who cannot hear the beauty of Beethoven, the wonders of Mozart. Um, and this makes things very difficult, because I'm in that state because I've been given my just desserts, the justice of God. But in a strange sense, there is a mercy to it, because I'm actually shielded from what I don't have. But there's a further aspect we've also explored, which is imagine, and again I will say, I move into the next world after my death, and I haven't been that great of a person. But all of a sudden, I'm in a place that is wondrous, expansive. I'm experience, if you will, and you know, again, metaphorically, visual experiences I've never seen, colors I've never seen, music and sounds I've never heard, feelings and textures, a mobility that is shocking compared to, if you will, this you know, meaty cage <laughs> that I'm currently in. And all of a sudden, I'm moving through these wonderful landscapes, these beautiful places, experiencing things I never could have experienced in this life. And I think, wow, like I, I made it. I'm in heaven. It's wonderful. And I tend, again, I suddenly encounter beings that are telling me it's not. You think this is wonderful, but it's not. It's actually a, a really unfortunate place you're in. And imagine how confusing this would actually be, and how hard it would be to believe that you're in a place that isn't that grand. Imagine even worse if an individual was telling you were in a horrible place. A place that would be, an analogy, like a dung heap, or a pigsty. But you look around and it's exquisitely beautiful and wonderful. That is the justice and the mercy of God. We're placed in a place we deserve, but it itself is actually wonderful compared to the world in which, from which we have come. There is a sense in which I don't, I, sorry, there is a sense in which I do think we can make sense of this to a degree. Um, I think, for example, of someone who is like a millionaire playboy. Someone with lots of money, no cares whatsoever in the world, 
and really actually spends their life really doing nothing but enjoying the fruits of this world. They're not concerned with the welfare of others. At the same time, they don't disdain or hate others. They just move around drinking fine wines, eating fine food, flying from place to place, exploring as they wish. There's no experience um, and no, no sensual gratification that they cannot have. So as they move through this world, it is just sweet and delectable and perfumed and comfortable blankets and couches and beds. Um, now imagine someone coming up to them who has almost nothing and trying to communicate to that individual and saying, my friend, like, you're in a horrible place. And they look around and they see multi-million dollar homes, jets, the most perfect clothes, everything you could ever imagine. It would be difficult for them to understand. And all of a sudden this individual starts talking about the sweetness, right, of knowledge. Or the, the, the silky soft ass of nature, for example, of solving a difficult problem. Or of trying to actually let go of one's attachments and seeking peace, serenity, and wonder in the simple. Such a thing would be very, very difficult for that person to understand. But that's just someone who themselves isn't, hasn't, sorry, hasn't lived a life of great, if you will, darkness. Imagine if I myself am, instead of just a rich person, I am a drug dealer. I, in, I gave this example before. I've, I've, I'm selling methamphetamines, cocaine. I am actually have a human trafficking ring. I have a prostitution ring. In such a state, I have more power more money uh, and pseudo-respect, if you will, than you could ever imagine. And you come up to me and you start talking about justice and compassion and mercy. I don't just don't understand you, I, th I think it's completely foolish. I think it's nonsensical about what you're talking about. I am in a state which is heavenly from my perspective, which is perfect in power and sensuality and the any experience that I wish. This again is an analogy, <clears throat> I believe, for the next world. Um, even in the other example I gave previously, where you have an individual who is actually a drug addict, the idea of quitting, of giving up that drug, is itself a sense of torment, a horrible sense of torment, even if they still have some echoes, some, some faint memories of what it was like to be normal. When you begin to talk to this individual and you're asking them to quit and you're asking them to come home and you're trying to call attention to the nature of their, their being, which says, I'm sorry, emaciated and scabbed, they often can react as, as if you are the dark one, as if you are being cruel or mean or self-righteous in a holier-than-thou state of being. But you're asking this individual to become whole. I think it's the same in the next world. That's what I personally believe. You can be in hell, as the Bob said, thinking you're in heaven. Because when you pass beyond, you're placed in an experience, in a landscape, with mobility and senses that you, you never had before. You are a bird released from its cage. However, from the standpoint of grades of being far above you, you are in a heaven of, say, a worm in a dung heap, or a beetle in the ground, or a sow or boar in the pigsty, a snake upon the ground. And yes, they are heaven for the snake, because the snake doesn't know better. They can't know of the wonders of the human intellect, or service to humanity, or compassion, or the, the, the wonders of actually solving difficult problems, or actually contributing, or... And I think this is actually what we're looking at. And this is where the justice and mercy of God meet. He has mercifully gives us a wonderful experience, blocks from us that which is above us. But at the same time, that experience is very lowly compared to what we could have if we wish to strive. And that's his justice. And at the same time, where the veil where we can't see up is our mercy so we can enjoy where we are, it is also the veil of justice, which prevents us from truly understanding what we could have had. So it really has this, again, this, this sort of flipping duck rabbit <laughs> uh, aspect to the study. 
So this study uh, of the afterlife in the Baha'i writings um, that I've presented here over six sections, with this being the conclusion section, is just in the hopes of trying to lay a series of foundational concepts so that we can actually move on to journeys in the future. That this is really, if you will, the, the core uh, of attempting to reach out and do our best to understand the pictures that we find within other scriptures. And I will suggest uh, several issues here, because there are certain aspects that um, without doing this study, we couldn't, I believe, we couldn't really start to get a handle on. Some of those things are related to what we would normally think of as the Eastern religions, and some of those of the Western religions. Um, one of the first one that pops up to mind is reincarnation. Um, there are many, several talks, sorry, uh, on, by Abdu'l Baha on reincarnation that I suggest everyone read. Um, at the same time, anyone familiar with Buddhist writings or Hindu writings sees these motifs and pictures in it. I do believe if you start thinking about the picture that we've uh, presented here, that you will have quite a bit of, if you will, um, things you can use to unpack those pictures. Uh, because we do take on bodies, we do return to the world, if you will. But I do think that we have to really, really, really unpack these notions independently now that we've actually studied this, if you will, a general view of the Baha'i afterlife. But reincarnation is one of them. But there's also aspects of a sort of reincarnation or return that would actually have to be dealt with as well. Uh, a example, of, I guess you would say a peculiar example that isn't often brought up, is the issue of John the Baptist in the New Testament, for example. Uh, Jesus Christ says he is Elijah. This happens in one famous case after Jesus Christ comes down um, on the Transfiguration. And there's a period where actually the apostles ask him, uh, but we thought Elijah was supposed to come first. And what Jesus Christ says is, if you would have it, like if you can receive it or understand it, uh, John the Baptist was Elijah. So there is a sense in which there is a return, but there isn't. Now there are large sections of the Book of Certitude by, by Baha'u'llah that actually deal with this issue, and we will bring those to bear. And I think even those themselves enable us to, if you will, better understand what is meant by reincarnation in the other scriptures. But again, that's to be unpacked later. Um, another one, or another I could just rattle off three quickly. Uh, one is the concept of Anatman. Uh, this is a doctrine in Buddhism, which seems to proclaim and is understood by many people to mean that there is no self. And it actually means no Atman. An Atman being taken as, if you will, the teaching that we found within the Upanishads and within the Hindu scriptures related to there being, if you will, a divine spark that is within each individual that is actually in some sense both a part and not a part of some greater Atman, that which is beyond all things. But this relates to our passage through um, into the next world. Um, it is as if you will a, you know, the analogy often given is, is a caterpillar reaching out from one leaf to another. This passage between that does somehow doesn't carry on uh, some essential aspect of us, but that that individual reaps, if you will, the rewards and punishments of the life that I have led. Or I have not. <laughs> um, I only point this out because it's something we actually really have to consider independently, and this relates also to the concept of nirvana. If you will, the ultimate state of Buddhism, and how can that picture be squared with the picture that we see within the Baha'i writings? Um, same thing with moksha in, in Hindu thought, that final, if you will, the drop returning to the sea. How can we incorporate, given these relate to the ultimate goal of human existence, how can we incorporate this into a picture and utilize many of the concepts that we've seen here, as well as others, to bring to bear and bring forward this greater beautiful picture that can bridge between the different faiths? So there are those within the Eastern tradition, but at the same time, there's aspects within the Western traditions we would have to address as well. One thing that may have actually jumped out at people uh, from a uh, Western background 
uh, especially if you've been raised within Christianity or Islam for that matter, um, is that within the Judeo-Christian scriptures, it seems very clear that hell is eternal, that it never ends. That someone who actually achieves heaven has achieved heaven, and that's the end of it. Someone who has actually rejected and lived a life of evil, they actually move into hell, and that's it. It's eternal. So there is an issue, I think, that really has to be addressed within the eternality of heaven and hell. Um, so we have the, as well, the general resurrection. Um, in a small way within the Old Testament, within the New Testament, and within the Quran, there are scriptures that seem to relate directly to a general resurrection of humankind. And what that could mean, and how does that play out into the, if you will, through time destiny of an individual soul? How can we unpack that? How can we understand that in light of the pictures that we have seen from the Baha'i writings, and bridging, if you will, these beliefs um, by using also, if you will, Islamic, uh, Christian and Jewish scriptures. So I hope uh, this uh, video series on the great beyond has offered some thoughts, uh, shared some scriptures that you haven't seen before. Um, I hope that your studies continue and you critique much of what I've said and develop your own understanding. Please remember um, for the, well, this lecture series and any in the future that you don't have to watch the entire video because there is an audio format that you can download in the description, and as well the PDF with all the quotes, if you wish to actually review them, all of them with citations. So thank you very much everyone, God bless.